Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on my new time on Tuesday at 3 in the afternoon, Hawaii Standard Time. Coming to you from beautiful downtown Honolulu. I'm Stan Osterman, uh, retired from military, retired from federal civil service and state civil service. And I think I probably pissed off the federal and the state government by doing a, an edit op-ed today in the Star Advertiser that uh, tries to talk about what some of the private sector is doing in hydrogen that the government sector is not bothering to even do anything with. So they may, they may kill me by next Tuesday, so hopefully I'll still be here Tuesday for my show. Anyway, today we got a, a great show. A uh, previous guest has been on a couple times. In fact, he holds a record um, for a number of views on YouTube for a show that I did called Hydrogen Safety. I just checked uh, the other day. It's over 37,000 views, which is pretty cool. But I was basically walking through his equipment about all the safety features in his equipment and how it all works. But we've got Chris McWinney from Millennium Rain coming to us live and direct from uh, Dayton, Ohio where he uh, started his company and, and has it growing uh, by leaps and bounds. So Chris, welcome to the show. I'm really glad you could join me this week and um, you're really kind of overdue. I've been, been wanting to have you on the show, but uh, getting so much stuff done, retiring and everything, it's, it's been kind of hectic. But thanks for coming on today and I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Stan, for having me. We really appreciate the opportunity to share with folks uh, what's happening in the hydrogen industry from our perspective. Great. Well, Chris, could you start off by telling the viewers uh, a little bit about yourself and how you got into uh, Millennium Rain and what you're doing in the hydrogen world? Yeah, well, it started in my garage um, back in uh, 2003. Um, and then prior to that, it goes back, clear back to 1993. Um, when uh, I first came up with the idea of wind, solar, and hydrogen working together um, to create, um, a a per put a person in a position where they could be completely energy independent and off the grid. Um, and uh, so I didn't pursue that right away. Uh, after several business with a partner of mine, Dave Herbal, um, and how it would work, um, we kind of parted companies for 13 and a half years. And then after 9-11, and I saw what was going on with the uh, energy and, you know, how tied we were to foreign oil and that kind of thing, it, it encouraged me to try to take a closer look at what we had thought up 13 years before that. And so I, I wrote a patent and I sent it in on something called a residential hydrogen power plant. And uh, basically bought myself a year to start working on that concept. And, uh, and then I ran into Dave again after 13 years of not seeing him. Right when I sent the same day I mailed the patent in, as a matter of fact, he showed up. And uh, so we started working on it in my garage and, and um, building several different types of electrolyzers and then realized the direction the market was heading was also going to be fueling uh, vehicles of many types and that we were going to need to learn how to build uh, hydrogen fueling stations and, and basically be able to provide a packaged product that would do everything in one package, make the hydrogen, purify it, uh, impress, impress it. it, store it, and dispense it. So um, that's what we ended up doing. And in 2013, we uh, moved into a 40,000 square foot building and later purchased that building. And um, so then in 2016, we actually stopped sales for a while uh, so that we could pursue getting our products uh, 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 certified. And we ended up with uh, two certificates of attestation um, on six electrolyzers and 10 different size and types of fueling stations. And um, we started up our sales again in, um, in February of this year, and we're already over 1.2 million uh, so far this year. So um, this will be our first profitable year. And uh, we're really excited about the future and how many people are really getting excited about hydrogen and the products that we have. That's great. I know that uh, I talked to Andy Marsh, the head of Plug Power about two years ago when they first turned a profit and they'd been running in the red for years. And, and the first year he turned a profit, he was so excited. And I, so I, I know you're, 
you're probably feeling that same uh, boost and that same adrenaline. Um, it feels good to get out of the red and into the black. And um, I know that's taken a lot of hard work on your part, a lot of traveling, a lot of uh, meetings, a lot of uh, working with regulators and, and standards folks. So can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that, that part of, uh, of what, you, what you've been into lately, working with codes and standards folks? to make sure that your concept, which is kind of all working on the small scale, um, fits into the bigger picture of the full spectrum hydrogen uh, fueling station. Yeah, well, um, you know, this is a pioneering industry and um, the codes and standards are in constant development. And um, I realized a long time ago that I was afraid that, you know, just, straight engineers that don't really think about money or economics much and 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 regulators might create regulatory roadblocks that would make hydrogen and the cost of doing hydrogen commercially too expensive. And so um, for the last four or four and a half years, I've been on multiple codes and standards committees within um, the uh, CSA group and also um, SAE, which is Society of Automotive Engineers. And then I've also um, visited a couple of times to the NFPA and I've even traveled to Europe and sat in some uh, international standards organization meetings, ISO meetings. And um, it's interesting to see uh, the different companies' uh, perspectives and angles of approach. You have the big auto manufacturers, the OEMs, and they have one perspective on how things should be done. And then you have the big gas companies um, and they've got their perspective on how things should be done. And then you've got, uh, you know, smaller players like Millennium Marine Energy, which has a completely different perspective on things. And um, our perspective is, is that the current way that hydrogen infrastructure is being built is too expensive to stand on its own. And the only reason that it's working right now, frankly, is that the state of California is putting up so much money, generously so, and thank goodness so, but they're paying for as much as 80% of the station. And, and then so what that does is, is it, it masks the fact that the station cost at three to $4 million total, um, depending on how many kilograms a day it produces and, and, and can fuel in cars. Um, it, it just not, it's just not um, financially feasible for it to pay for itself unless it gets to where it can do uh, 500 kilograms a day. And then the station costs $4 million. And so you have an issue where if you're going to put out a brand new fueling station and it, let's say it costs three million, and the state puts up eighty percent, and you know, and then that station goes out there, and a new you want to put it in a place where you know there's not any other stations yet, and what that does is it says, okay, there's only twenty or thirty cars in the area, and if you're ever going to get to the point where you're going to dispense five hundred kilograms a day, you need a uh, hundred forty three cars filling every day to consume that, uh, which means you need a thousand cars in a five mile radius. And um, so when there's only 6,500 or 6,700 cars in the whole state of California, it's kind of difficult to have those type of uh, dynamics help your financial uh, uh, pro forma uh, develop an organic growth for putting out hydrogen stations. So our take on it is, is that you should start small with stations and that you should build the amount of hydrogen to meet the demand. And as the demand outstrips the supply, then you take that hydrogen generator and, and fueling station combination package that was too small now, and you relocate it to a new location in a day to open up new territory, and you put in the next biggest size. And we have four uh, pre-made, um, products with certificates of attestation that meet all the codes and standards that you can do that four different times, all the way up to 64 kilograms a day. And, um, and then you're in better position to make the jump to the bigger stations. So um, that's a conflict. 
in, in, in the way everyone else wants to do it. So uh, we're kind of seen as a renegade a little bit. And um, that's OK with me because I believe the concept is correct and it will and it will end up uh, really being one of the key factors to making hydrogen infrastructure proliferate um, around the world. Well, let's take a look at some of your equipment and see uh, let, let the viewers look at uh, the kind of stuff that you've got that goes like is your smallest one still two kilograms a day? Yeah, we have a two kilogram a day, day unit and a four kilogram a day unit. I don't have any of those on this slides, um, okay. but um, but uh, we have uh, this unit here is our latest. Uh, we started uh, actually uh, Paul Pontio over at Blue Planet Research on the Big Island uh, and I um, scratched the first one of these out on a um, napkin and. and over in Kona one day uh, because he was looking for, he needed 12 kilogram a day unit because he was driving it off of sun. And when you do that, you're only gonna get about a quarter of its production. So that way he would get at least three kilograms a day produced. And so that's why we designed that system to begin with. And the old system used to have six stacks and was called a 330 triple twin. Well, this is our first 342 triple twin. It only has three stacks and we took the plumbing fixtures that plums it all together from 24 ins and outs down to nine. Um, so that saves a lot of money, saves a lot of leak points. Um, and then we also are moving water through this and has a circulatory system on it. So it kind of sweeps the bubbles off the plates and allows you to get more production out of the same space. And then we also added another 12 um, cells to the package. And this thing is running sweet. I mean, this is the best I've ever seen in this class that we've ever produced. I'm so proud of it. And um, if you look back at the picture again, you can see that it has it has the hydrogen generator on the bottom side, and then it has over to the uh, to the um, left. It has the purification, and on top it has twin compressors. So you're looking at a system there that'll do 12 kilograms a day, and um, has three separate electrolyzers that are running together. So that's why we call it a 342 triple twin because it's got triple electrolyzers and twin compressors. So, um, uh, and it puts out 6,000 PSI uh, into your storage. Okay. And then we have a station that goes along with that then that has 24 kilograms and a fueling station. And it comes as a package for about $325,000. Wow, that's great. Um, and What's up next? We got another slide coming up here that uh, shows us a little more of an animation. This is uh, the next yeah, step so, up. So um, we actually are building this. This is this is the old 3D version before we started building it. And um, this is going to be our 64 kilogram a day electrolyzer. This is in a 10 foot shipping container, so it can go anywhere in the world and sit on a you know with one of those containers uh, ships um, and um, it's really exciting to see this come together because those stacks that were that you're seeing in there, there's four of them in that. Um, the stacks that were on the other one, they're four times bigger than that stack. Um, they produce 16 kilograms a day each stack. So um, uh, it's a sweet spot to have 64 kilograms a day. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a station that will do 64 kilograms a day, and that's the electrolyzer portion of it. Um, so um, just this week, um, we confirmed that um, we can get the pressure where we need it to be, the purity where we need it to be, and the stack holds its dimensional stability. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's a huge breakthrough. We've actually been working on that stack and that system for almost three years now to get it to do what it did. And that's after we already kind of understood what we were doing from developing all the smaller systems that we did. So. Um, that's going to be the building block, and you'll see one of the last slides that we show how we can do megawatt scale systems now to capture large wind and large solar. Okay. We're going to take a quick break here and uh, back in 60 seconds with Chris McGuinney to look at some more of his projects and uh, some bigger plans that he has for the whole U.S. Aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My program airs every other Monday at one o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. 
Most of my programs deal with my own life and law experience. Recently, I interviewed Alex Jempel, who I have known for over 30 years, about his voyage across the sea as a lawyer from Tokyo to Hawaii. Those are the type of stories that I like to bring and like to talk about, human stories about law and life. Aloha. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And I'm the host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're on every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. And we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to windmills to hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at 4 o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here with Chris McWinnie from Millennium Rain, coming to you live and direct from Dayton, Ohio. So Chris, what, I just had a quick thought while we're on break there. What are the chances of you just taking one of the larger um, electrolyzer stack and making uh, back to the smaller scale, but with the larger electrolyzer stack, so you could do maybe you know, four to six kilograms a day with a smaller unit? Is that feasible? I'm not sure I understand the question, Stan. I, 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 we, we do have a two kilogram and a four kilogram a day system already perfected. Um, can you clarify a little bit more what you're talking about? Yeah, there? how big is the stack? Um, you said that the stack on that, um, the new uh, 10 foot containerized one, the, the larger 64 kilogram a day is of basically four times bigger than than the um, the one that the, the triple twin. Um, could you, yeah. you could you possibly take one of those stacks and make a single stack unit that would produce you know more hydrogen but in a smaller footprint? Um, kind of kind of. Uh, yeah, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and we have plans for that. Actually, we have a 32 kilogram a day one that'll be smaller, and then you could take that single stack. It'd be 16 kilograms a day and it would fit on the same platform as the 330 triple twin or the 342. So yes, that's possible. And it is something that we will do in the future. Okay, great. Well, let's keep going with the images and uh, let you talk to those and we'll keep on pressing through. Okay. Um, well, this is an interesting one because this, this is a report that was done by McKinsey. It'll give a person a really good uh, a look at the future of hydrogen. Um, they're expecting, um, that um, there will soon be uh, 400 million um, cars on the road. Um, there will be uh, uh, 15 million to 20 million trucks and 5 million buses and 30 million jobs will be created by the hydrogen industry. Um, and this is by 2050, I think. Um, and then uh, Millennium Rain Energy's plan for hydrogen infrastructure has the potential to negate 17 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and to give you an idea how much a metric ton is, um, the next slide kind of puts that into perspective. Because um, I was wondering, you know, that sounds like a lot, but just how much is that? This this Bush aircraft carrier right here is uh, weighs 100,000 metric tons. And there's actually a misprint on this page. It says 17,000 Bush aircraft carriers. If you add it up, it's actually 170,000 Bush aircraft carriers stacked up on top of each other. That's like a giant mountain range of CO2 that our plan for uh, building hydrogen infrastructure in just the mainland United States alone um, and um, we'll, we'll take out of the air uh, by uh, replacing carbon-based vehicles with hydrogen-based vehicles. And just for so the, it's a big deal. Just for the viewers really quickly, could you explain why that is? And just talk just for a second or two about fuel cells and fuel cell vehicles and sure. how you can negate the yeah. carbon impact? Yeah, so, um, a fuel cell is an electrochemical device that takes in hydrogen and 
air from the environment, which contains oxygen. It takes the oxygen out of that air, recombines it with the hydrogen to make water, and it strips off the electrons. And then the electrons are able to power an electric motor or charge batteries and that kind of thing. So um, that's the way a fuel cell car works. And when it does that, your only emissions are water. And then if you've gotten the hydrogen from like we do with an electrolysis, which takes in electricity from renewable energy, and then it takes in um, water, and you run that at renewable electricity through water, through an electrolyzer, you get out the hydrogen and the oxygen. So when the car then is running, it's taking in the same oxygen you released, and it's putting out water again, and it's a beautiful round trip of uh, sustainability. Well, and with so zero carbon. It, it was zero carbon. That's right. And so every time you put a hydrogen fuel cell car on the road and it's running on renewable hydrogen, you're removing all of the CO2 that that car that they would have been driving was, was emitting. And so that's how it adds up to 17 billion metric tons. And that was, that was actually a report that we commissioned. It was done by a professor of environmental studies at um, Johns Hopkins University and then his work was reviewed by another professor at Yale University, and they're the ones that presented us with that information. Okay. And what's the next image that we have? So, you know, we've got quite an extensive IP portfolio that we've developed now that protects our products in, um, in uh, the United States, uh, the European Union, and Canada. We have nine patents. We have three trademarks, and we have the two certificates of attestation. And, that's a picture of what the certificate of attestation looks like there um, for uh, the fueling stations. And one of the key things is that they're called a um, scalable hydrogen fueling appliance. And because it's called an appliance, that makes a really big difference in coding, uh, in, um, in, in the codes and standards in that um, it doesn't, in most jurisdictions, um, you would not have to get a permit. Yeah, you don't need um, a building permit. It's, um, it's, it's, like a, it's like a piece of equipment. It's not a building. Right. It's, it, it'd be, I was in a codes and standard meeting in Canada at the CSA group, and there was a guy there that was with natural gas companies, and they'd used the same technique for quite so many years. And they said it is like you go to the store and you buy yourself a brand new propane grill and you put it on your wooden deck and that's permittable and you, without a permit and you don't, so you've, you've bought an appliance that is flammable and explosive and um, you're going to actually light it on fire on a wooden deck and because of the way the safety is engineered, it was given an appliance code, so therefore you don't have to get a permit to go buy a grill. And it's the same type of approach with the hydrogen fueling station. Oh, that's really great. Because we ran into the same thing in the military. Um, there was, uh, nowadays with EPA standards and stuff, it's almost impossible to do uh, outdoor shooting ranges for the military, and they need them. They need to shoot live weapons to qualify before they deploy. So a company came up with a concept of building a modular indoor shooting range, and it was considered equipment because it was completely modular and movable. You could pick it up and just mm -hmm. put it on pads or put it on, and that made a huge difference in terms of how you could locate it and how fast you could build it. And it, it really saved the, the military in many ways by um, using that same approach you're using to get the equipment out in the field yeah. quickly. Yeah, and, and our stuff is equally modular. Um, when we put the one at the Navy uh, Research Lab in Washington, D.C. over a year ago, um, it was I pulled in and had it in the back of a rider uh, truck and um, 45 minutes later, it was sitting on the ground running and uh, it could be moved um, and <laughs> from its place and put indoors or move some to some other location just as quickly. Um, all you need is a water hookup and the, and the electric outlet at 240 volts and a 60 amp breaker. So uh, pretty much standard electricity at most people's places. Great. Let's bring up that next image and um, look at your, your big plan for the whole U.S. So um, this is uh, our 
plan for the transcontinental hydrogen highway and the fueling infrastructure. We plan on putting 27 stations coast to coast from Los Angeles to New York with our um, with our pre pre manufactured stations. Um, and uh, we our, our goal is to have this done um, in the the end of 2021, first part of 2022. Um, we're all we've already placed our first one in place since we announced this in April. Um, and it is at a Honda Toyota dealership. Um, and um, they're actually buying five used Toyota Mirais and they're going to be um, providing um, those cars to customers um, that bring in their car for service and it has to stay for a couple of days. So they'll let them have a loaner car and be test driving a hydrogen car in the meantime, which is uh, really exciting to see them take that effort and, and take that step. So it's, it's really, really cool. Um, and then, um, but we're not going to just fixate on the mainland United States because Hawaii is also a great opportunity on the big Island, especially uh, where we could just put five stations there and uh, you could travel every place on the big Island and always find fuel. And so uh, we're, we're really pushing to try to make that happen and looking for people um, that want to maybe own the stations and that kind of thing. The ones on the mainland, Millennium Rain Energy is going to pay for. Um, we're currently looking to raise $20 million and um, uh, for a 10% stake in our company. And we're going to take $3 million of that $20 million and put those stations out. So they'll be company owned. Um, I'm hoping that we can find some, some people um, with the Aloha spirit to, to go out there and help us put these stations together then and build the, uh, you know, the first highway in, in Hawaii there on the big Island. How are um, you getting that word so, out? How are you well, looking for investors? Um, so um, actually we've talked to um, three billionaires in the last three, three uh, uh, weeks. Um, and we've got lots of other people. We, we went out and we put a professional um, slide deck together so we can go do a road show. I can ever get shook loose from time to go do it. Um, and um, so we're just going to get aggressive and go out and seek the, seek the people. And it's not about the money as much as it is the people who can bring the experience to the table. And we've, got, we've already talked to some pretty serious players that have some great past experiences that can be beneficial to us going forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward. And I, I, you know I'm going to be helping you on the Big Island with uh, Paul. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities Absolutely. on the Big Island of Hawaii. And, uh, and I've, I've talked to uh, actually some folks in Australia yesterday that are looking for a way to invest in Hawaii hydrogen. And um, I'll be talking Great. to Paul and Mitch about that some more. Um, and we'll, we'll see what we can get going on the Big Island. So I think- Well, you know, know Stan, one of the things I wanted to say, Stan, is, is that the world doesn't realize how fortunate Hawaii is to have people like you and Paul and Mitch and, and the other, and the other leaders on the, on the, on the big Island and on and on Honolulu there, you have, um, uh, Servco has taken a, a, a leader, a leadership position and put out a station and getting cars in. And, you know, you guys are really, you guys really have some great leadership there. And there's no doubt in my mind you have everything it takes to make this thing big and 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 may and be and be the banner, uh, you know, the 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 star that everybody can follow and the example. So I, I'm really happy to be have some kind of part in that. Well, we're going to keep on trying because if you can't make it work in here in Hawaii, it's not going to work anywhere. And we've got more renewable right. energy that you, you can shake a stick at. And we buy all That's our right. fossil fuels from, from everybody else. So it, we've got more incentive, yeah. more financial incentive to get off fossil fuels than any other state in the union. And uh, we need yeah. to be doing it. That's right. That's right. Well, I think we have at least one more image up there for, to throw up and uh, let okay. you talk to. Yeah, so um, this is just a, I'm just going to go through this real quick because we've already touched on it. But the idea is you've got to get the cost of hydrogen below the cost of gasoline because it's, you know, we all want to help the environment and we all know we need to be green, but for most people, if they can't afford it, they're not going to do it. And so if you look at that, at, a, at, at that GGE 
is stands for a gallon of gas equivalent. And with our uh, Mega 4 TA70 in the top right hand corner there, we can get gasoline equivalent down to three dollars and seventy one cents per, uh, and 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 that's cheaper than gasoline is in Hawaii. It's cheaper than it is in California, and it's cheaper than it is in Europe. And and but it doesn't happen that way overnight. You've got to start small down there with the SHFA 200. You see it's at 571 and then it goes to five dollars and then it gets to 371. But, you know, that's that's what we think the magic that we've created is by packaging our systems, running our business the way we are. We're debt free as a company, low liabilities in, 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 in our, our, our geographical position where we have a lower standard of living here. Um, so we can we can actually make these products in uh, in mass quantities and and get this to happen. So and the last thing is a the other, the last thing is a slide about the the mat the the large scale systems. And so once you build that network of stations, you need to have larger scale uh, hydrogen systems that are working on large wind utility scale wind and solar fields that can then store that energy and and then transport it in and backfill those stations networks that you've built and so here in the bottom left hand corner you can see that's an electrolyzer that would do 160 kilograms a day and eat 336 kilowatts of power to do so and if you put three of those together you're at a megawatt and you're at 480 um, uh, uh, kilograms a day in production and you can scale it from there and then the last thing I want to say about that is hydrogen is the greatest way to store large scale wind and solar. Um, some preliminary numbers I've done compare batteries at $3, $380 a kilowatt hour in storage to as low as $30 for hydrogen uh, yeah, per kilowatt. Ten, time, 10 times less. You know, and that, that fact, Chris, has not caught on with the, with the grid folks. I mean, I talk to That's them all, right. the, all the time and they keep going batteries, batteries, batteries. And I go, I know you're going to need some batteries in the mix, but when you start yeah. to get to, you know, hundreds of megawatts or gigawatts, yeah. it ain't going to be batteries. Yeah. It's going to be hydrogen and it's going to be right. because of the cost. And they just don't get it yet. Even Hawaiian Electric doesn't get it. Hawaiian Electric yeah. Light Company on the Big Island, which is part of Hawaiian Electric, those folks over there are starting to get serious because they're, they're starting to see what Paul's system at Kuvava can do in Kona and it, it's got their attention. So um, I'm, I'm looking right. forward, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing your systems, you know, all over the place, Chris, and I'm, I'm glad they're with the Navy now and the Army and, you know, we have our two out there with the Air Beautiful. Force and, and uh, yeah. really, really appreciate it. But believe it or not, we blasted through a half hour and I just want to thank you again for, okay. for being on the show and coming to us uh, past your dinner time and almost at your bedtime over there in Ohio. And uh, looking forward to seeing you in Hawaii sometime when you get out here. Yeah, hopefully very soon. Mahalo. Okay, aloha. And thanks to everyone for watching today. And this is Stan Osterman for Stan the Energy Man signing off till next week, Tuesday. Aloha.